Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, we're really excited to bring on Rob Hopke, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist in private practice in Berkeley, California, but we all know him being a prolific writer. He has numerous articles, reviews, books over the last 30 years. His national best-selling book, There Are No Accidents, Synchronicity in the Stories of Our Lives, has been very popular throughout the world. We're bringing him on for a particular expertise. He was one of the first Jungian psychotherapists who explored Jung's relationship to homosexuality. He wrote Jung, Jungians, and Homosexuality, and Men's Dreams, Men's Healing, as well as other texts, but we're coming to him wanting to explore how the formation of gay male identity is understood within a Jungian context, and we expect to have a very free-ranging conversation about Mm -hmm. all kinds of things. So, Rob, thank you so much for making time to be here with us. It's great to be here. Thanks so much. Yeah. A topic of perennial and of course, interest. We've all app- yes, and uh, one that has been much requested. So we're really happy to bring you on to help mm-hmm. us with this one. And we all appreciate your book so much. When we were in training, we we used uh, your wonderful book, A Guided Tour of the Collected Works, and uh, still have that one on my shelf along with your others. So uh, it's such a right. delight and an honor to spend time with you. You're yes, one, of the, you're uh, that, one of the elders of the community. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, I was saying to Joseph, I mean, <laughs> partly it's because, I mean, I went into psych be, to become a psychotherapist right out of undergraduate. So I was 10 to 15 years younger than most of the folks, right? So, you know, because there's a mm-hmm. typical kind of um, second life, second and second stage of life career for a lot of folks. But for me, it was my first career. So that was that. And oh, so wow. I think that's a little bit why, like, I wrote, you know, Guided Tour of the Collected Works, or I wrote Jung and Homosexuality, and then Jung Institutes or groups would have me come around, and they were expecting some 60 or 70 year old to get off the plane. <laughs> and this 29 year old gets off the plane, and they're like, You're Rob, <laughs> you're Rob Hopkins. So now, actually, wow. now that I'm 66 years old, awesome. I sort of look the part, but back then, you know, because this book, <laughs> that, both of those books, Guided Tour and Young Young's Homosexuality, came out in 1989, right? So they're 35 yeah. years old. Wow. That's right, 35? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. So that's a little bit sort of funny. I mean, I was sort of the sort of uh, the enfant terrible of the Jungian world for for a decade there. Perfect. <laughs> so that's great. So, Rob, jumping yeah, into the water, what prompted yeah. you to write that first book, Young Jungians and Homosexuality? What's the backstory there? All right. So the backstory there, interestingly enough, is I, so I have two master's degrees. I came out here to California from the East Coast uh, after. Being a gay activist at Georgetown University. So I went to Georgetown. Mm-hmm. I was a French Italian major at Georgetown. And around 19, uh, I graduated in 1980, around 1978, uh, you know, it was the height of gay liberation back then. So we got together what we called then the gay people of Georgetown. You know, now we, you know, have an entire <laughs> alphabet soup. It'd be LGBTQQIAP plus whatever. Blah, blah, blah. But we were just the gay people of Georgetown. <laughs> and I was 19. Um, you know, I'd had my first uh, gay relationships in high school. Uh, in a certain sense, I, I wouldn't say that I grew up in necessarily a especially sexually enlightened family, but it wasn't a, a sexually judgmental family. And um, I was kind of, you know, um, I was kind of one of the smart kids in, in school, mm-hmm. in high school. So I got a lot away. Mm-hmm. I got away with a lot. So I had a lot. I had gay relationships in high school. 
talk about with whom, because that might get us into trouble <laughs> if any of my high school friends are no, undoubtedly no, going to gonna watch this, right? But some of them the already know that. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so when I get to Georgetown, I, I wouldn't say I was out, but I was definitely experienced at that point. And then, of course, in D.C., it's an urban environment. Get together with a lot of different gay and lesbian folks. It's 1978. It's the height of gay liberation. So we formed Gay People of Georgetown. Uh, we go f- through the student senate, which basically gives us permission to be an official club of Georgetown University, which is kind of what the bylaws of the university allow. But of course, for those that don't know, Georgetown is the oldest Roman Catholic university in the United States, founded in 1789. Mm -hmm. And it's been run by the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, since that point. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is Mm -hmm. 1978 in the Roman Catholic Church, which isn't any more necessarily that enlightened about any of these issues currently, and sometimes in a way even worse. But back then, When the Jesuits got wind that there was this gay group on campus, they went forward (laughs) and in contravention to their own bylaws, yanked our official um, recognition as a club, which was really problematic. It it gave the students at Georgetown, most of whom were pretty homophobic, I would say, permission to harass us. We were physically harassed. We, as a student club, had permission to put up a gay history, uh, a gay history exhibit at the library display case. It was vandalized. Someone urinated and defecated on the materials. When we would call campus, when we would call campus security to help us, they would say, you're not an official club. We're not going to help you. Um, You know, posters were pulled down. We had to run a gauntlet to get to the room where we were meeting, it was, it was ugly, right? It was really ugly. Yeah, and and I would say t- kind of traumatizing to me too. I, I, it took me quite a while in therapy after this to kind of work through that, mm-hmm. but nevertheless. So because the university had contravened its own bylaws, we contacted the ACLU. And so seven of us sued Georgetown University for official recognition, which is this sort of like, Famous, infamous lawsuit in Roman Catholic circles. A lot of lawsuits of previously Catholic institutions that had become slowly Mm. secularized with time, hitting some of the, mm, when I say sort of hard lines of Roman Catholic theology and them having to work it out. So this is one. Here's a Roman Catholic, public Roman Catholic university with a gay group that they're denying official recognition to on the basis of theology, even though they can't do that. So anyway, so I was coming out here to go to Lutheran Seminary to explore becoming a Lutheran pastor in Berkeley. After that experience, I was like, you definitely need to get your ass to California. (laughs) It's like the Bay Area and San Francisco Bay Area. If you want to live as an out free gay man, and if there's any hope of you being an out gay Lutheran minister, it's only going to be in California at that point. This is 1980. So I came out here. And um, that lawsuit's cooking along. I signed off on it when I I signed off and withdrew myself once I moved out here in California. We were really we weren't suing for any uh, financial damages. We were just suing for the principle, right? And eventually, you know, fast forward, it got settled. They agreed to allow a gay straight alliance on campus so that we could have dialogue about it. So that way, it was a little bit of a fig leaf. They weren't approving homosexuality, but they were approving a discussion about homosexuality as a university. So anyway, it's a long story. That's an interesting story. But how did I get here? I got my degree in. uh, So I came here to do an MDiv, decided I did not want to become a minister, but I was very attracted to the pastoral counseling piece. So I got a master's in theology from Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary and did all of the coursework I needed to become a marriage and family therapist here in California, which is at the time you could do that. You didn't need to have a counseling degree. All you needed to do was have certain courses within a master's degree, get a degree in biology, Mm. get a degree in education. They've tightened that up now, thank God, and I think that's a wise idea. But I got this degree in theology, and then I went on to do a second master's degree in counseling. Because I felt like mm, my theology degree really wasn't as comprehensive as I wanted it to be. So I went to California State Hayward, an excellent counseling program. 
and I got assigned, uh, my student advice, my, my advisor, my academic advisor was Swiss. So this is how we're getting to Jung, right? <laughs> so she was sort of stunned that I had gotten through seminary without reading any Jung. And this is, again, we're talking like 1983. This is sort of pre-Joseph Campbell, before mm -hmm. Jung became super popular in the late 80s, right? Mm -hmm. So at that time, I'm in my very psychoanalytically or Freudian psychoanalytically oriented internship in which Jung was, you know, again, Freudian prejudice, was seen as sort of psychotic. So my uh, Freudian <laughs> supervisors were not supportive of me reading Jung. I hadn't read it in oh. um, hadn't read it in seminary. Weirdly enough, right? It wasn't really you know, religion and psychology weren't really close bedfellows at that point either, right? So my Swiss advisor in my second master's degree said, "You need to read Jung." So what I did with her for two years is I did an independent study. I I. I Formally signed up for the courses she was teaching, but I didn't actually attend classes. And instead, what I did was I did a two year long independent study in which I read the collected works from volume one to volume 18. Oh, okay. wow. oh my God. Right it, was, on. it was like, I mean, something only a, a ridiculous 24 year old would do, right? I mean, now I look back on it and I'm like, okay, what? what? Yeah. So yeah. you can imagine what the effect of it was. I was like, okay, my. You know, I was having 18 dreams a night and I was like so flooded with archetypal and deep material. I immediately got myself into Jungian analysis, right? And in order to process both the intellectual as well as the psychological part of it. So in the course of doing those two years in which that's all I did was read Jung from cover to cover, frankly, I went through and I'd sort of marked every time I saw Jung talk about homosexuality, right? Because I had come from, you know, a gay activist perspective and I was like it and I'm looking in the literature. There's nothing at that time, 1983, there was nothing in the literature about homosexuality. There was an article or two here or there or a mention. There was certainly not a monograph. I, so I, what I expected, you know, naively not being um, acquainted with Jungian scholarship, I expected to just go to the shelf and read. You know, like what I was reading in, in the Freudian literature, you know, like there's a mm -hmm. whole host of books on in the Freudian literature at that time explaining homosexuality. I mean, many mm -hmm. of them negative and homophobic, but nevertheless, there was a literature, right? There was nothing in the Jungian literature. There was one book, and mm -hmm. I forget what his name is. He's a German writer, Peter Kramer, Peter Scheller. There was one monograph in German on Jung and homosexuality, what Jung had written on homosexuality. There was nothing in English, nothing in English. So, mm. so I'm ticking off what Jung has said in the course of the collected works on homosexuality with my thought that my thesis is going to be Jung and homosexuality. It's going to be the comprehensive liter mm. the, the first comprehensive literature review of what Jung actually said about homosexuality in the course of the 18 volumes of the collected works. I was supported by that because there were two gay analysts here in San Francisco, David Stockford, and Michael Steele, a uh, blessed memory. I think they're both passed at this point. In addition to that, John Beebe was the editor of the mm -hmm. San Francisco Young Institute Library Journal, right? Also gay. Out. Yeah. And I actually knew his boyfriend personally from Cal. So I was like, oh, this is great. So there was this little group of us, you know, that were kind of like, yeah, let's get a literature going here. So I wrote Jung and Homosexuality for my thesis for Hayward State. And um, with the intention that I was actually going to publish that as a book. So I'm hanging around Berkeley here, which is where I live. I have lived since 1980. And I go to the Shambhala bookstore down on Telegraph Avenue. And I'm, you know, looking for Jungian literature there. They had a great Jungian section. And the manager there was an editor of Shambhala. Mm -hmm. So I get to talking to Kim about the book. And she's like, oh, yeah, no, definitely. Shambhala, Jung, uh, what they had published, they had published Linda Leonard's book, and it had been an enormous bestseller oh, yes. for them. And so suddenly there was now a Jungian mm -hmm. imprint line at, at Shambhala, and they were dying <laughs> for Jungian literature, right? So they're like, oh, and oh. Jung and homosexuality, mm -hmm. they were like, great, let's do that. So 
I submitted it to the editor. The editor and I figured, well, it's going to be Jung, Jungian homosexuality. So then I was going to do all of the subsequent secondary literature, anything I could find that Jungians had written about homosexuality. Mm. And then I was going to put forward in the third part of the book my own ideas on how Jung psychology could apply, particularly to gay male experience. So that was the book. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, Kim said, people are coming here all the time wanting to read Jung. And there really isn't a guide to the collected works. You know, like we have, you know, all 18 of those forbidding black volumes sitting there on the shelf. But like, if you want to read about the shadow, where do you go? And she says, you pull out the index and there's 18 pages of references to the shadow. Yeah. So I said, you know, that's funny because um, at that point I was licensed and I was supervising and people and my interns were saying like, you're Jungian, you know, you're, it's sort of a, mm, mm -hmm. I would say sort of a, an amalgam of Freudian and Jungian, right? We'd love to read Jung. We've read a lot of Freud. We'd like to read Jung. So I said, you know, I need to write a guided tour of the collected works. So I picked 40 concepts. I wrote my little description because I had read the collected works so comprehensively. I knew wow. yeah. which pieces, with, you know, like if Jung was talking about the shadow, which article was the most accessible and which articles were a little bit more complicated, technical or scholarly. So if you wanted to just start easy, you could start easy and then you could go down. And then I referenced all the secondary mm -hmm. literature. And so that got published at mm. the same time. <laughs> it was sort of an interesting thing. I mean, it's one of these things that, you know, again, only when you're 29 are you going to be writing two books at the same time. <laughs> so that's what happened. I mean, the Jung's home, Jung Jungian's homosexuality had been more or less two thirds written by the time it got published. So that's mm -hmm. how we ended up here. You know, that's it. That's what the guided tour is. And the guided tour. Yeah, I've been really happy with that. I mean, it's sort of like, I guess, a standard book for folks that are yeah. teaching intro to young, yeah. you know, so it's great. And I updated Absolutely. it in 1999. Mm -hmm. Shambhala came to me and said, you know, there's been a lot of secondary literature that's come out on a lot of these topics in the last 10 years. So let's update it. It could probably stand another updating, but um, no one's, you know, no one's really contacted me for that. But Jung Jung is homosexuality. Mm -hmm. That was mm -hmm. good for me because I, the, the, after having read Jung, I really did want to see what subsequent Jungians had said about homosexuality because I knew kind of what Freud had said about homosexuality and what subsequent Freudians had done or not done mm -hmm. with the topic. So I was like, OK, that's going to be an interesting thing. And um, so then we'll go, <laughs> then we'll go to the, then we'll go to the uh, sort of official Jungian uh, non-reception of the book is what I'll say. Um, I was not, I'm not a Jungian analyst, was not interested in going to a Jung Institute, was, you know, I already had a, a <laughs> practice, you know, I, I didn't really see any real reason to. And again, as you can probably tell, I'm pretty extroverted. I don't need an institute to create a <laughs> professional community around me. And then a lot of the Jungian training struck me as pretty much like going to a Jungian seminary. And so having already gone to a Lutheran seminary, <laughs> I was like, I know I don't want to go to a Jungian seminary either, <laughs> you know, so that was that. So I'm sort of like this. And on top of it, not being an analyst, you're I, I realized and this is again, I'm young, right? I'm not under the collective pressure to sort of fit into a particular mm -hmm. set of stuff, right? I have more freedom right. as an intellectual, as a writer, as a therapist, if I'm not part of a community. So it was a very intentional decision to not become a union analyst, right? It wasn't just me being oppositional defiant at age 33. So, um, <laughs> so that was that. But what that did was, of course, I'm not part of the club. Right. So who's this like gay 33 year old dude who wrote this comprehensive scholarly work on homosexuality? Wow. Right. So I sent it to James Hillman. James Hillman reads mm -hmm. the 275 pages of it and says, yeah, I don't think there's really much to say on that topic. I don't think we're going to publish that. I was like, uh, OK. I sent it to Chiron. Chiron's like, what? Who wants to read about that? Nah. So that's why Sean Paula published it, really. I tried to get it published, the Union thing. I mean, James Hillman did say, boil it down to an article and we'll publish it in spring. So that's what I did. I mean, so a sort of a resume of the book got published as a standalone article in spring publications, right? 
And the same with um, Chiron. You know, there's a, there's a couple of um, articles I wrote on men's issues that got published that used the material from it. John Beebe was super supportive out here. So I, I you know, I, I wrote a mm. ton of articles on, on var- I would use various books to kind of put forward those ideas. But yeah, Jung Jung's Homosexuality got published in Shabala. And so it is the first, and at this point, the only hmm. um, mm-hmm. single monograph on homosexuality in the Jungian literature. I mean, uh, oh my gosh. on homosexuality in the sense of what Jung and Jungians have written about homosexuality, right? Right. I mean, there's, there's other, and, and, and so, we'll get into that. There's a lot of other stuff that's been written since, but that's the primary. I wanted to have a, a single but, comprehensive standard scholarly source for everything Jung said. So mm-hmm. I'm really happy. I'm really happy with the book because that's so, what so it has us. served. That served that right, function. So, I'm sorry. So tell us, what did you find? What what did Jung have to say <laughs> about homosexuality, and what have Jungians had to say? Can you sort of summarize it for us? Oh yeah, oh. no, that's yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, so, unsurprisingly, I would say, uh, in a way, James Hillman wasn't wrong. Jung didn't really write a whole lot about homosexuality, but Jung didn't write a whole lot Mm -hmm. about sexuality, right? There's a lot of ways in which Jung's writing stands in contrast to Freud, right? A lot of what Jung was doing was, uh, I wouldn't say uh, kind of against Mm -hmm. Freud, but definitely charting his own kind of way forward. And he felt, of course, he felt Freud's almost obsessive concentration on sexuality was out of balance. So Jung Mm -hmm. didn't, you know, Jung wrote about sexuality, certainly, certainly wrote about gender, femininity, masculinity, wrote a book, uh, wrote an article on marriage, et cetera. But what I found is that in like the huge 18 volumes of the collected works, Jung mentioned homosexuality maybe 30 times. Like there was, there were no single articles like there were in, in the Freudian literature, both from Freud and subsequent Freudians, on homosexuality just as a subject. So Jung was always mentioning homosexuality. Jung always mentions homosexuality in reference to other things he's talking about. So in a weird way, <laughs> in a weird way, that's a plus and a minus, right? It's a plus in the sense that Jung is not bringing a pathologizing attitude to homosexuality. So he's not, mm-hmm. he's not falling prey to the idea that somehow this is some big hunking pathological condition that needs to be explained mm-hmm. per se. And so like with Freud, you know, he, Freud comes up with 25 different explanations around why people became gay. That didn't trouble Jung. Jung was not interested in explaining, mm-hmm. quote unquote, explaining homosexuality. So that's a plus. I felt like, okay, that's an interesting thing. Like Jung just sort of took it as a kind of just one part of human natural phenomena and would discuss it as he saw fit. Right. On the other hand, Mm -hmm. you have to sort of say, too, given the fact that it's, uh, you know, kind of an ongoing part of the human experience, like to not look at it is a little strange, too. Especially since, you know, Jung looked up at a lot of issues around male-female relationships, but didn't really get into it that mm-hmm. much. So that's not too surprising, you know, until the advent of a gay affirmative uh, psychotherapy movement and, uh, you know, out gay lesbian literature. You know, I mean, Jung died in 61, right? So I wouldn't expect him to be concentrating on that much. So what I did find, however, was that, number one, um, he didn't have a very pathologizing attitude toward homosexuality. He didn't really feel as if this was some sick thing that needed to be explained away and cured. So that was number two. Most, Mm -hmm. as you might expect, too, if those of us that know Jung, number two, most of the times when he referenced homosexuality, he would put it within a larger historical context. Because of his great, you know, acquaintance with classical literature, et cetera, he had an awareness of the way in which this was an enduring pattern of human behavior, 
not just some sort of like weird modern perversion that happened to kind of erupt in the Victorian mm-hmm. era. You know, so he would often reference classical literature around homosexuality, um, which, again, I was very it was very welcome. <laughs> you know, it's sort of again, I think it, it, uh, it sort of it sold me on Jung. I mean, there's so many things about Jung that I feel so much affinity for, but that was one of them. You know, there, there's definitely mm-hmm. that. Um, because of the context in which he's writing number three, because of the context in which he's writing, uh, which is in the early 1900s, right? The early 20th century, he consistently says, I'd say says, consistently says three, four times, he does not think it should be a focus of legal prosecution, right? Mm -hmm. He's writing in Switzerland, but, you know, he's right next door to Germany, England. So he's saying that, you know, he does not, he, if it's, if it's anything, it's a psychological disturbance. It's not a moral failing. It's not a legal issue. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, me reading Mm -hmm. that in in 1989 in the midst of gay liberation, I was like, wow, that's pretty great. Right. Um, That particular piece can go in both directions. Right. Which is to say, a lot of the early 19, a lot of the psychologists or uh, I would say gay affirmative sort of, you know, neutral or affirmative uh, psychologists, psychiatrists in the 20th century would use that as an argument. Uh, it was, would use the argument that homosexuality is a sickness that people can't help. So it really shouldn't be considered a crime. I mean, that's essentially how, you know, the laws were repealed in England was the, on that basis of that argument. Hmm. But that is a sickness, mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. a crime, right? So I'm like, all right, well, that's a rather ambivalent way to go. Um, yeah. But what would you expect from a psychiatrist? Of course, a psychiatrist is going to make, uh, you know, and then mm-hmm. what Jung would then do is call for compassion or any of those psychiatrists, Freud, some of the mm-hmm. Freudians, et cetera. I mean, even the most homophobic Freudians in the 1950s are using that argument, right? We're trying to cure it mm-hmm. is a sickness. Yeah. So really, you shouldn't be sending these people to jail. You shouldn't be prosecuting this, right? It's an illness. So that's a piece of it. Jung didn't land too much on that, as you might expect. I mean, he's not super political. He's not super legal. He's interested in the inner life. So there is that. Mm-hmm. He stated, however, I think the things that I found the most positive were that he pretty much stated almost every time it came up in the collected works that he felt that homosexuality had a specific individual meaning for the individual that the analyst was Mm. um, obligated to help them explore. And I thought Mm -hmm. that was pretty great. I was like, yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, um, you know, rather than some sort of generalized kind of, Mm-hmm. generalized uh, stereotype of uh, what g- gay people are. Jung felt, he took, ev- as Jung does, right, takes every individual on mm-hmm. their own merits. And let's look at that. Yep. Sometimes he would mm-hmm. say that it, it was sort of a, it might be a defense against heterosexuality. Sometimes, you know, so sometimes it wasn't. Some, what is the individual meaning? I felt like that was really great. I mean... Back, especially back in 1989, that was not something you were hearing, you know. So that's why I wanted to write Mm. the book. I feel like, okay. And then there there was a few times that Jung did, you know, so those are attitudes. I call those attitudes. He brought certain attitudes toward it. And then there were three explanations, I would say. Uh, I'd say maybe about three or four times he he said that he felt homosexuality was, quote, unquote, constitutional. In other words, it was not, mm. someone's homosexuality mm-hmm. was not a result of psychodynamics. It was how they were born. It was constitutional. And he would say, because it was constitutional, mm-hmm. he, had, he mentioned a couple of cases in which people presented themselves to be, quote unquote, cured. And that was his reaction. It was like, well, I'm not going to be able to cure that. That's constitutional. The second explanation that I found and he would say this, he felt that it was an identification with the feminine, quote unquote. So he would primarily, I, I don't, 
I, we have to wait until we get to Emma Young or Marie Louise von Franz or any of the first generation Jungians to have anyone talk about female homosexuality. Jung didn't talk about. It. So he's talking about male homosexuality almost exclusively, right? Um, couple of mentions of animus ridden women in England, you know, as <laughs> feminists looking for suffrage, you know, women's suffrage, et cetera, but not very much. There are a couple of mentions here and there of like, you know, kind of lesbians. Yeah. But mostly male homosexuals. So he's looking at men. He's looking at male homosexuals on the basis of his male homosexual clients who are coming to him to be cured. And he felt at times, he says in the collected works in various places, he felt that it was an identification with the feminine. These were men who had identified with their anima, as he would say it, or the archetypal feminine for reasons that had developmental um, connections to how they were brought up, as well as perhaps defensive um, you know, sort of defensive uh, uses for their psychodynamic, psychodynamics. So that was like, there is that. And then the third mention, which I'm, you know, I still, well, see, here we are in 2024. I'm still waiting for someone to pick this one up and run with it. Mm. Um, and I think the current environment is more likely to have that happen. But the third thing he said was he felt it was an incomplete detachment from the archetype of the hermaphrodite. In other words, it was a form of psychological androgyny. So, you know, kind of, you can sort of see how that sort of flows out of the idea that somehow here we have anatomical biological men who are identified with the feminine. So the result is an androgynous person, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and of course, what's rich about that, I feel like that's the most powerful piece of, you know, a little hint of a direction to go if you're using Jung, is that, you know, the androgyne is pretty ambivalent, right? It's both sort of a symbol of unity and psychological perfection. It's, you know, the conjunctio oppositorum, you know, it's the goal mm -hmm. of all of analysis is to sort of integrate male and female and to live that out in some kind of easy way. But it's also monstrous. It doesn't exist in the real world. It's an amalgam of two conflictual things, right? So is it, is it a monstrous freak of nature or is it the psychological ideal, right? You know, the idea that gay men might be gay because of on an archetypal level, they're, um, they have not differentiated themselves from the original hermaphroditic or androgynous polymorphous, perverse place that we come out of, right? The very early bisexuality in which the human infant is responsive to all stimuli equally, has not differentiated itself into genders or the divisions of gender, you know, is in Jung. Like that's, Jung says, says that probably three or four times. And that's characteristic of his later writings, as you might expect, right? So he'd be like, okay, so those are the three explanations. What did Jungians do with it? <laughs> Jungians completely ignored one and completely ignored three. What Jungians did, as one might expect, was there was, if, if Jungians wrote about it at all, which is, was not a lot, I'll just say. I mean, I had to sort of pick through Eric Neumann to try to find references and pick through uh, uh, you know, various first generation Jungians to try to see if they, there was not very much written about homosexuality, period. But if they did write about it at all, it became kind of a cliche to just say gay men are identified with the feminine. That's kind of it was just yeah. sort of a Jung. It's a Jungian cliche. At the time I was writing back in 1989, mm -hmm. that was it. And I was like, okay, um, there's no question. So my response to that as a 25-year-old out gay man living in, the, you know, what was then the 20th century, I'm like, how does this jive with my actual lived experience as a gay man? <laughs> like, some of these things are sort of useful in the sense, some of what Jung and Jungians have written are sort of useful in the sense that, again, kind of very characteristic of analytical psychology and Jungians in general, they're not that pathologizing. 
and they're not that obsessed with etym, you know, etym, uh, etiology. They're not obsessed with kind of explaining things as an illness. They're not pathologists. That's good. But these explanations didn't really, didn't really land. I mean, there's no question that gay men have a different relationship to the quote-unquote feminine than heterosexual men or bisexual men. You know, I mean, mm. I think in gay male culture, and mm. we'll talk about that some, I mean, there are all kinds of manifestations of the way in which, you know, gay men have a pretty easy, non-conflictual, even identification with the feminine. But uh, gay male culture is pretty masculine. I mean, pretty masculine, especially late mm. 20th century gay male culture, right? I mean, naked men everywhere, mm -hmm. cocks and dicks everywhere, <laughs> everyone's in leather, it's the village people. It's like really, really male. Like on the ground, my life living, I'm like, women don't play that much a part in gay male culture, <laughs> to tell you the truth. <laughs> if any, there's a certain kind of hostility That's to women, right? And it's like these, oh. I'm like, I'm going to all male environments all the time as a gay man, and unions are like, eh, eh, nothing about the masculine. I'm like, eh. I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's really not in line with my experience. I'm like, you have two men with two cocks having sex with one another, and we're not going to talk about the masculine. I'm like, okay, yeah. So <laughs> that hit mm. for a few subsequent. So, so here we now moving into the '90s, right? That kind of that weirdness that conundrum kind of hit a number of different people i think the most uh the person i had the most conversations with was uh, the late gene monic eugene monic who wrote phallus sacred mm -hmm. image of the masculine yes. right yes mm -hmm. so like yes. gene and i were in conversation with this all the time he was like yeah that's why i'm writing this book i'm like yes please write this book about phallus right <laughs> i mean joseph and i were talking yesterday about some of Jung's uh, writings talks about the phallus, you know, the underground phallus from memories, dreams, and reflections, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, yes. But nevertheless, so I was like, okay, so, uh, you know, I wanted to talk about the masculine, but I also felt, and, and this is, I still feel, to tell you the truth, and, you know, times have sort of caught up with us here. I really kind of feel like the, you know, uh, androgynous, the suggestions that homosexuality was an entree into a certain kind of androgyny was also in line with my mm. experience, right? I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. we're, I'm running around San Francisco Bay Area and there's drag queens everywhere doing gender fuck, you know, these, these guys with beards like mine or pretending to be women. Nowadays, I mean, we actually have a language for it. You know, we're talking about transgender, mm -hmm. non-binary identities. Now we have a language for it and we have a whole panoply of people who are actually living that, right? That's what I would say. So Jung's suggestion that um, gay men have their finger on a particular kind of androgyny and a particular kind of integration of male and female, I felt was like the most positive and potentially powerful thing he had to say. Mm. But no subsequent Jungians have pursued that. Uh, June Singer wrote her book on androgyny back in whenever that was. It was quite a while ago. I mean... Kind of late 70s, I think, right? 78, 79, 76, maybe. Um, but again, very <laughs> scholarly, very Jungian, you know, not especially oriented toward a popular audience. You know, there's an enormous amount of material on androgyny and alchemical texts, which, you know, I think, mm -hmm. you know, make all of us really excited. <laughs> it's not exactly like that's the most accessible material to general public, right? Alchemy, right? Uh, uh, but nevertheless, really rich and wonderful. But again, not much was um, sort of picked up around it, I would say. So that's why uh, after Young Union's Homosexuality came out, uh, Scott Worth, out gay analyst, Karen Carrington, lesbian uh, psychotherapist here, uh, at, at that time a candidate for the Young Institute, the three of us got together mm. and we sort of created sort of a gay Jungians group here, uh, a sort of a scholarly gay Jungians group here, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that's why we came out with me, um, same sex love, a path to wholeness. Like we collected articles uh -huh. mm. and we wanted to make sure, number one, it was gender balanced. So half the articles are men, half the articles are written by women. And we wanted, you know, to actually talk about female experience as well. 
At that point, Christine Downing comes on the scene with all of her religious studies and Jungian background, and she writes, you know, Myths and Mysteries of Same-Sex Love, again, as a woman. She wrote an article for our book, Same-Sex Love, Path to Wholeness, really totally wonderful article I continue to assign and use, uh, The Journey of a Late-Life Lesbian. She came out as a lesbian later in life. Oh. And she talks, in, uh, you mm-hmm. know, and she's such a wonderful writer. You know, she talks in the most evocative, way, poetic way about, you know, how her love for her female partner is sort of is part of her fulfillment as a woman, right? So here we have finally like the burgeoning of a little bit of a literature on women's experience, lesbian experience, same sex love between women from a Jungian point of view. And that's kind of where it stuck. I mean, I would say after same sex, uh, same sex love got published in 94. I mean, <laughs> weirdly, I kind of felt like at times the impression I got was that because I had written such a comprehensive book, everyone kind of felt like that's all there was to say. And as I said to Joseph, I mm. was like, I thought that was going to be the first book of an entire literature that would then be created. Oh. You know, I didn't expect that was the definitive mm. word. I thought that was the first. First, let's look at the literature review. Then once that's in place, which was mm-hmm. my book, what are we going to do with it? And so that's also kind of, I feel like what I, I would say, you know, to be fair, frankly, is at the time I was writing that book, there were three out gay analysts at San Francisco, and there were no out gay women, no out lesbian analysts mm. in San Francisco. So I feel like most of what I've seen in the, you know, again, as an outsider, the you know, official outsider, the union, I've seen most of the effort go into actually bringing gay out gay, bisexual, lesbian uh, analysts into analytic training. So now there's lots of out gay, lesbian, bisexual analysts that I know of here in San Francisco, yes. at least, for sure. So it was like the effort mm-hmm. didn't go mm-hmm. into too much doing the writing or the scholarly. It went into the clinical and the practical, which I think is great. I mean, that's actually going to have much more impact on the culture anyway. But I felt like what then happened Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just going to go through my career around this particular thing. Um, I was invited. I was invited to be a guest lecturer down at Pacifica Graduate Institute here in Santa Barbara, which pretty much runs its graduate program mm-hmm. along Hillmanian lines, right? Very much kind of in the in the line of uh, uh, imaginal psychology, right? And they had this here in Cal. So in California, you have to do a cross-cultural course in order to get licensed, right? You have to do a cultural sensitivity course. Mm -hmm. And they're usually horrible. I mean, the the courses are usually awful. (laughs) You know, they're a bunch of (laughs) racial and ethnic stereotypes sort of shoved in, you know, like, this is what black people are like, and this is what Mexican people are like. (laughs) They're awful. They're awful. They're often a reinforcement of racism rather than a deconstruction of racist attitudes, right? But Pacifica does this great thing. And I'm totally surprised. They still do it. They do that course as a psychology of prejudice. So instead of talking Mm. about Mm. specific cultures, they look at the psychology of prejudice in general, in which there's an enormous amount of wonderful literature. Why are are people racist? Mm. Why are people homophobic? Why are people misogynistic? What is it about human psychology that makes people otherize, demonize, stereotype people who are different than they are? And what they do in the psychology of prejudice Mm. course is every year they pick a particular prejudice to focus on. So one year they'll pick misogyny or sexism. Next year they'll pick racism. Well, I got invited Mm. in when they looked at homophobia. I got invited in as kind of, you know. (laughs) <laughs> the gay Jungian to talk about homophobia, right? And we got a chance to really kind of dig into some of that, right? How, what, what parts of the shadow get projected onto gay men and lesbians? What parts of the heterosexual shadow? What parts of the cultural shadow? On and on. Well, it was so 
great. <laughs> I mean, it was really great to talk about, and the students got a lot out of it. But it sort of, down there at Pacifica, inspired a lot of gay, lesbian, bisexual, non-binary, transgender students that were getting their PhDs there to start doing, using some of these Jungian concepts and taking them further applying them to their own experience, mm -hmm. right? So someone did a dissertation on asexuality. Someone did a dissertation on <laughs> the uh, on actual brother-brother incest, like not symbolic, like actual people who had sex mm -hmm. with their siblings, you know, as, you know, it was interesting. I'm, God bless him. He got enough people to talk to him about that experience, right? So I got brought in as a what they call an external mm. reader, right? I mean, now they had they at the time they didn't have mm. an out gay faculty member there. Now they do. Doug Thomas is an out gay faculty member there. So Doug, often Christine Downing, and I would be uh, the dissertation committee for this sort of second generation of younger folks that are now taking these Jungian concepts and going further with them. You know, I. Some of the dissertations are really super, mm -hmm. just super interesting. I mean, I, I sat on this dissertation committee for this woman who is looked at uh, married couples in which one of the partners had uh, gender transitioned from male to female. So it was a regular heterosexual couple. And what had been the man had transitioned into being a woman and they stayed married. And so she did this dissertation. She, mm -hmm. she got a dozen couples to talk to her. Really kind of incredible. The last one, and we'll talk yeah. some about this because I know this is of interest to all of you folks. The last one I, I did was um, uh, a man who sort of uh, put, uh, put forward a, a, a revision of the anima, animus concept to make it non-binary. He calls it the animum. Mm. So I was like, <laughs> Okay, mm -hmm. super. So, and he's really going, and, mm -hmm. and that book is actually going to be published by Ratledge next year. I'm, I really pushed him uh, to, to get this published. So, yeah, his name is James. Rob, let's take a pause for a second and, uh, and stay uh, circumambulating that topic because yeah. most frequently when we do our dream analyses, we stay to pretty traditional uh, interpretive lenses mostly because we're trying to educate people on corollaries. So we have that story that in a man's psyche, the anima is going to present as female and act as a linking agent between the ego and the collective unconscious. In a woman's psyche, the animus will show up as male and perform a linking function as well of some kind. So uh, for many people, that's true. And maybe even for the majority of people, that might be mm. true in terms of their symbolism of their dreams. But we do have people writing in and saying, well, what about the, uh, the gay, lesbian, and other community? Mm -hmm. I mean, should we expect those same imagistic rules to apply to us? Mm -hmm. And if so, how, sh how, how do you suggest we orient to this? So let's open up this idea about how anima and animus show up um, symbolically in the psyches of gay men and, and also uh, gay women. What's, what's your sense of that? Well, my sense of it is based yeah. on my own experience as well as my clinical experience, right? You know, I guess maybe the first thing I want to sort of say theoretically is I don't, I never understood why I, why Jungians think that what I would call largely culturally conditioned gender roles, expectations, and forms should apply to the psyche. I mean, you know, the animus can show up mm -hmm. as a leopard. I it can certainly show yes. up as a man. <laughs> I'm like, you know, in other words, like our 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 very time limited gender roles of the late 20th and 21st century don't really apply to something as eternal and as formless, basically formless as the psyche. I mean, the soul figure. Mm. So that's where I would go. So instead of kind of getting it very tied to gender, calling it animus or anima or even animum. I just think of it as a soul figure. I mean, the soul figure, and this is, I, mm -hmm. I would say I sort of have warrants for doing that on the basis of James Hillman's work with that particular concept. That's the, his work with the concept, mm -hmm. I think, has been the most helpful. Anima, anima, anatomy of a personified notion is kind of the classic text on that. So the soul figure in the psyche, as you quite rightly just said, 
provides a kind of connection between the outer world, the inner world, the conscious, the unconscious, etc. Whatever figure serves that function as the soul figure might show up as a man, Mm -hmm. might show up as a woman, might show up as a man for a man, might show up as a woman for a man, might show up as a woman for a woman, might show up for, you know, in other words, what gay and lesbian experience does, I would say, is because I'm primarily oriented toward other men and lesbians are primarily oriented toward other women. Our soul figures often are same sex in our dreams and have always been. Mm. So like in Men's Dreams, Men's Healing, that book that, you know, you all read that I would look at, I wanted to, I, I, I have two chapters. I, well, the book is structured so that I'm comparing my work with dreams with a gay man and my work with dreams with a straight man. And I wanted, you know, I sort mm-hmm. of alternate those. So I have two clients. I look at them both. Where do their issues intersect because they're men and where do they not? And that's those two chapters yeah. in the middle. The anima is definitely male in my male, gay male clients' dreams. A, a long, long series of rich dreams. So that's what I would say. The first thing I would say around that is like, I think it's pretty easy to just jettison the gender binary around that particular concept and focus more on its function, right? The soul figure connecting or guiding, uh, complementing, uh, challenging, aiding the dreamy go, the conscious self, right? Sometimes it's a guy, sometimes it's a chick, Sometimes it's a tree, sometimes it's a dog, sometimes it's a rock. I'm like, it can be anything. It's the psyche. It's, you know, it's like, I think that's it. What was, I think that concept, I think, got kind of grew out of a very 1940s, 1950s sense of gender, which I think we don't really have any longer. So, you know, I guess what's going to be interesting and kind of what's interesting for all of us, frankly, is like, you know, now we're sitting with folks who are either actually transgender or non-binary, identify as non-binary. What's their soul figure going to look like if, in fact, the gender binary doesn't apply to their or they don't feel like their gender, their uh, the gender binary applies mm-hmm. to their identity or experience inside or out. Mm-hmm. So I feel like, yeah, that's so, it's interesting. Go, go for it. How would you how would you uh, define if that's even the right word? Uh, for somebody who, what what is a soul figure? Is it consistent? Yeah. How do you know this this rock is my soul figure, <laughs> or animal, or anything? I would say Not versus you know, shadow or archetypal or something else, or, yeah, or an image would, of the self. I think that's a great, yeah, right. right. I would say, and this is what I say to my clients: I I look for the juice, like. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. A figure appears in your dreams or you meet someone and there's this juice. There's this electricity. You're obsessed with them. You're they're fascinating. They're erotic. They're sensual. You can't get them out of your head. You want to be around them. When you're around them, you, you know, <laughs> you feel fulfilled. It's your, you know, your soul figure, right? You know, so it's like my, my soul figure, my, my soul mate, so to speak. I think that's sort of the common way people talk about it. We as Jungians mm. attribute that to a number of different things, right? Projection primarily. Like what people are doing is mm-hmm. they're projecting certain unconscious qualities of their own psyche onto that person. And of course, we Jungians think that's a very natural and positive dynamic, right? That's how we meet the unconscious primarily, is by projecting it out Mm -hmm. and meeting it and then pursuing it. I mean, it's important, especially when you're doing couples therapy, make sure you understand that that's a projection. That's not them. (laughs) That there's a real person (laughs) behind that projection and that that person may not actually meet your expectations around any of that. But when you say shadow, that's, that's the aspect of it that's often, at least initially, in the shadow. Like all of that fascination and all of that juice is underneath inside you. You just didn't realize it. So it's in your shadow, right? So that's where sometimes it gets to be mm, dark, right? I mean, you could be stalking Mm -hmm. this person. You're obsessed with them. You find it disturbing in a certain way, you know, uh, intrusive, et cetera. But nevertheless, 
in answer to your question, I would say that the soul figure, one of the, the primary characteristic of someone's soul figure is that level of energy. That level of energy is what drags people down into trying to examine why and what is so fascinating about that person. Certainly when that person or that those figures appear in dreams or fantasies, you definitely know it, right? There's, and usually there's a level of consistency about it. It's the same type of woman, or it's the same type of man, or it's the same type of energy that gets uh, kind of consistently presented by the psyche to your awareness, right? So that's what I would say a lot of times when I'm talking, just, you know, just talking to my clients, I'm like, everyone's sort of got their type, right? Like, what type of guy do you? kind of find attractive? What type of woman do you find yourself endlessly fascinated with? And that's another way to kind mm -hmm. of trace like, okay, that's generally what I would call someone's soul figure, what Jung might call that's anima or animus, you know, yeah. but soul figure. Yeah. But, like but that's it is interesting type. how these categories sort of, uh, they, they mush together a little bit because we've, we've, you know, we're talking about projection and you can project on a, you can project soul or you can project shadow. And of course, then there's positive shadow. And at what point does that start to look like soul? And, uh, you know, I mean, I think we're all aware that somehow th these, this system of thought doesn't tightly fit together. You know, it's, you know, people, people want it sort of locked down and Jung was not interested in locking it down. You know, Freud's <laughs> theories not. are much more kind of uh, succinct and clear cut, but, but Jung just said, I just want to, I just want to notice what is. And so there's a way that some of his ideas work really well. And then some of them, it's like, well, if there's, yeah, this is, this is a little tricky. So I've always found the anima animus concept difficult to apply in some ways for exactly yes. the reasons that we've been talking well, about. Well, I think that's correct. I mean, I would hold all of these concepts lightly. You know, I think because of A, I mean, Jung yes. held all of those concepts pretty lightly too. So I think that's what I'm saying. I yeah. think, as you can say, that's in contravention to our culture in which, you know, men are men, women are women. I mean, the, yeah. you know, we live in a culture that wants to lock everything down, right? But that's, I think, why all of us love Jung, because it's like, okay, this is kind of fluid. And when we get into the psyche, mm -hmm. uh, our definitions are not very clear. I mean, to say a little bit, uh, you know, in response to what you were just talking about, is the shadow positive, is it negative? I sort of say to my clients a mm -hmm. lot of times, it depends on what you're bringing, what kind of groceries you're bringing to the party, right? I mean, if you grew up with a very mm. sexual, and you grew up in a very sexually repressive environment, right, your, mm -hmm. your soul figure is going to look pretty sexy, pretty seductive, pretty, you know, okay. is that positive or negative? Well, it's negative in the sense that it's threatening to the ego. It's to, you know, it's definitely threatening yeah. to who you see yourself to be. On the other hand, it's a road toward sexual liberation. It's a, led, a, a road toward integration mm -hmm. and freedom. You know, for you to get from a sexually repressive environment to get much more in touch with your the fullness of your sexuality might be initially threatening, but also very freeing and liberating. Mm -hmm. Or vice versa. You know, if you come from, and this I'm speaking from the gay male community in particular, I mean, gay, gay male community, no questions, hypersexualized, right? I mean, gay men are having sex with everyone whenever they can have sex. You know, I live five blocks away from a gay <laughs> bathhouse here. And, you know, on Sunday afternoon, there's a line around the corner. I mean, sex, I mean, the upside of that is opposed to a puritanical sexual morality in the United States. Gay men have definitely liberated themselves from that. So that's the positive. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, everything's kind of always sexualized. I even get, I get, t you know, especially mm -hmm. at age 66, I get kind of tired of it. I'm like, oh my God, really? Seriously, can I just take a nap? Why do I have to be sexual? <laughs> it was all great when you're 20 and 30, but, <laughs> you know, your T level declines with age and you're just like, oh man, get this out of my face. I just want to have a cup of tea and a book. Anyway. <laughs> so if you're coming from a very hypersexualized environment, your soul figure may look like, um, you know, a conventional monogamous partner, 
you know, someone really settled, someone really tame, yeah. someone really a committed. I'm sorry. <laughs> A librarian. A librarian, for example, right? So that's why I think, you know, you're, you're, Lisa's great. I mean, I think that's a great thing to bring up that the shadow, you know, for especially for readers that are uh, readers or listeners that are actually uh, listening to this, right? You're becoming acquainted with Jung. Shadow isn't necessarily a bad thing. You know, sometimes the best qualities yeah. of our personalities are in the shadow because mm-hmm. we didn't grow up in environments right. that brought them forward, right? Call it the positive shadow or the bright shadow. So it's good to sort of think mm-hmm. that, yeah, initially the soul figure is often in the shadow. It's someone we meet outside or someone we fantasize about meeting outside. But then if we work with it, we see that those characteristics are can be parts unlived, undeveloped, as yet undeveloped parts of our own psyche. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yep. So leaning into that a little bit, Rob, um, talking about sexuality, Let's talk about the symbolic level of sexuality, because when we think that these internal images, who, which are symbolic, are nudging us in various directions to be sexual in certain ways with certain people. So when you're working or writing about this, how do you guide uh, an, a client to understand that symbolic level of their sexuality and their sexual mm-hmm. choices? Mm-hmm. That is a super question. I mean, that's just a great question. Yeah. How I work with it is very much informed by the cultural matrix that we're living in. So some characteristics of that cultural matrix, which we Jungians know about, is that this is not a culture that encourages people to think or live symbolically. It's a very literal culture. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't make, if you don't get paid in dollars, if it doesn't produce a product, it's not valued in this culture. Yep. So one of the things we constantly have to do as therapists with our clients is open up the symbolic, as opposed to the literal. So Mm -hmm. that's number one when when we're working with sexuality. Right. When somebody's bringing in a sexual issue with me. They're thinking about it very much, you know, penis, vagina, breasts, cum, anus, literal. Mm -hmm. All of those things that I just mentioned have a deep and abiding symbolic meaning Mm. that often Mm -hmm. people don't consider when they're enjoying their sexual life. But nevertheless, that's part of the power behind someone's sexual Mm -hmm. life Mm -hmm. is, in fact, the deeper symbolic meanings of why this particular physical union is so enthralling and fulfilling, Mm -hmm. right? It's not just the release of an orgasm, but it's what that release means with regard to who you are and who you're Mm -hmm. in relationship to. Now, Mm -hmm. I mean, I have to say, when I sit and talk about that with clients, they're like, (laughs) I've never (laughs) thought about the symbolic aspects of this. I was like, I'm like, sometimes Mm -hmm. dreams are very helpful. Because the dreams sort of, you know, again, as dreams do, I sometimes say dreams are ruthless, right? If you haven't looked at it, you will look at it in your dreams. The psyche will present it, right? So there we are. You're like, she has enormous breasts and you can't get away from them. So what does that mean? How does that feel? What does that symbolize, right? So, you know, you can talk, you, I'm, you know, I can be talking to this guy who's basically in therapy because he's a uh, quote unquote, a pornography addict and he's jacking mm-hmm. off 20 times a day to big titty porn. Not an uncommon mm-hmm. client that I kind of see as an out sort of identified sex mm-hmm. therapist. Right. Then I go mm-hmm. to, well, what do you think those breasts actually symbolize? <laughs> like, like, no one's ever asked yeah. them that question, right? I'm like, okay, yeah. you know, 
And now we're off to the races. Okay. That's what I would say. I think that the most powerful thing I do is actually the simplest thing, which is in the, in a matrix of a cultural matrix of literalism to just have start people start thinking about what their sexuality means or symbolizes for them. So then Mm -hmm. we have, and then the next step, right, is personalize, you know, again, okay, so we've had three, four discussions on what these very enormous, large breasts that got presented to you in the dream actually mean. What part of your own Mm -hmm. psyche do you think that represents, right? I'm like, blow your mind right oh my god i've never really considered mm. that yeah, yeah. And, and so one of the clients are like well i don't have breasts and i'm like uh it's your dream they're in there <laughs> no one else had that dream that's right, yeah. i'm like that's what i'm saying like <laughs> these are not again you know yeah. the step past literalism right instead of literally thinking of them they're just symbolically thinking and then symbolically owning them like okay what would that mm-hmm. be like I mean, again, something most men, I would say most men, not all men, but most men have never really kind of considered like, okay, what what part of your own psyche does that actually represent? And and then we go to what is it you're projecting onto your sexual partners, therefore? Like, what are you having your sexual partners carry for Mm. you that you should be carrying Mm. or that you should at least be integrating or owning, right? So that's how I work with it all. I mean, it's really just opening up the symbolic aspect of what is often sort of seen as physical and literal uh, in in our culture and Mm -hmm. sex. And I do that for everyone, right? I mean, you know, if I'm talking to a gay man and, you know, they're size, as we say, size queens, right? Obsessed with large cocks, right? I'm like, "Uh, okay, like, let's talk about what that actually means. Like, why is that an obsession? What is that about Mm -hmm. you? Mm -hmm. What is it you're trying to Mm -hmm. carry? What is it you're seeking out there? What is it you should be seeking out? That's That's where Eugene Monick becomes, you know, our guy and who it follows. Well, Uh, and it's interesting too, you know, kind of in the modern culture, you know, we go to TikTok and you type in BDE, big dick energy, right? And you've got like a dozen different representations mm -hmm. of like what it could mean, right? Like these different guys sort of like walking around with BDE. So I'm like, okay. So that's what I was saying. Like, I think there are a lot of ways. Well, I think we don't think about our culture doesn't encourage us in a Jungian sense to think about our sexuality symbolically. And yet it's the power of it is because of what these things represent. It's sure it's hormonal. Sure, it's physiological. But I mean, on the psychological, the psychological part of why sexual union is so satisfying has to do with that. Not just, you know, the physical yes. release of an orgasm. Right. right. Yeah. So that's how I work with and it. And also things become, things become mutable when they're translated from the literal to the symbolic, mm-hmm. which is where mm-hmm. change becomes possible. Right. Something you and I spoke about briefly as we were orienting to this um, interview was sitting down with men who particularly are addicted to pornography. And this is something I've done for years. Have them show me in the office, what, what, what is it that you're spending hours mm-hmm. meditating on and sitting with them mm-hmm. and asking that question, why that? Or why that theme? Or, or offering an archetypal amplification because this same theme comes back and back. And often, if, if we can land on that in, in a really useful way, they do feel like the grip opens up a little mm-hmm. bit and they have some fluidity about it. So you have a similar experience treating uh, pornography as archetypal or even as a fairy tale of sorts. I got, I, I got a bit of a name for myself as somewhat infamous. I became somewhat infamous among the Jung Institutes here in the United States because after Jung and Homosexuality got published, I got invited to various places, right? And they would want me to run, you know, I would do the lecture on Friday night and then I would do the workshop, right? And so the workshop I right. oriented around masculine, feminine, and the androgyne. But the masculine piece of it, what I did was frankly, I would just pick a porn story out of a gay male porn mag and I would copy it. <laughs> and I would have I would have this group of like white haired Jungians read this pornography <laughs> as if it were a fairy tale. Right. We have this wonderful wow. methodology in Jung. Right. We have this wonderful methodology in Jungian and Jungian writing of taking a fairy tale. 
right? And looking at it for its what its uh, collective or archetypal significance might be. And I mean, like that's essentially. I mean, pornography is not great literature, right? I mean, it's essentially a big old fairy tale. It's a fantasy <laughs> about this, that, and the other thing, right? That is so really that's it. So let's look at this. That's like, really so I, and so, that, <laughs> like, uh, and of course, you know, I was sort of like the bad boy of uh, this is the enfant terrible of Jungian psychology for a while, right? The bad boy. I was like, okay, I got all these like Jungian grandmas reading like stories from Hancho. But we're Jungian, we're, we're, we're seriously applying a Jungian methodology to that because I think within that material, right, as you're saying, like within the material that your clients are looking at, those scenarios, those physical characteristics, those situations, that person, their own fantasy of how they're participating in that situation with that person for that reason. Mm-hmm. All of that has a rich psychological meaning, right? So if you don't take it literally and you're looking at it symbolically, right? What's the princess mean? What's the toad mean? What's the glass slipper mean? (laughs) Right? What's the big dick Mm -hmm. mean? What's the locker room mean? What does the policeman mean? What is, you know? So I feel like that's one of the things, like in addition to, as you're quite rightly saying, um, uh, I would say sort of creating a more at least sex neutral, if not sex positive environment in which we can Mm -hmm. talk about all of this stuff much more openly with less shame, less inhibition. You know, that's certainly Mm -hmm. one big piece of it. Until we do that, we can't really get to what does it mean? And I'll say, I think as you do in your therapy and I have in mind with, with not just men, but you know, women, my non-binary client, non-binary clients too, you know, getting to like, oh my God, I never really thought about like what I'm looking for and what it would be like if I actually embodied that myself instead of putting it out Mm -hmm. there and trying to find Mm -hmm. it at the bathhouse or instead of just looking at pornography all the time and fantasizing about it, what would it be like if I actually were Mm -hmm. that phallic, if I were that fertile, if I were that receptive, Mm -hmm. if I were that ejaculatory, if, you know, in other words, Mm -hmm. all of the various sexual qualities have these rich uh, non-literal symbolic aspects to it that you sure. do find in commercial yeah. pornography and and gay literature, et cetera. Yeah, mm-hmm. that helpful, right? You're, so, I'm, so I, I'm getting, I wanna, my, yeah. getting my point across, right? Yes, yes, you are. Okay, totally. I, I want to I want to follow up because because you talked about doing these workshops on you know the masculine and the feminine and the androgyne and and I I, I am curious about how, what you think about this notion of the masculine as a psychological oh, yeah. principle or the feminine as a psychological principle because you know i think this is another very difficult area in jungian thought that i don't yeah. have a straightforward answer to but but i do want to say you know i you know there there are male people and there are female people and there is a kind of uh, embodied reality to that to that um, polarity to that difference, and I suspect right. personally, my own feeling is that some of the differences between men and women are innate. I mean, there is evidence to that effect. For example, uh, you know, women tend to be more agreeable than men, and the evidence says that this is cross cultural that it is stable across the lifespan. You can see some differences between males and females and personality-wise, even as neonates Mm -hmm. or even Mm -hmm. in primates. So it's impossible to pick apart what part might be cultural, but it seems like there, it seems likely that there is a piece of it that is innate. And is that what we're reaching toward when we talk about the masculine and the feminine and uh, you know, and, and just, it goes without saying that this is not meant to be prescriptive that women should be this way or that men should be that way. But just, you know, this is something I think about a lot and I'm, I'm wondering how you would react to any of that. Well, we all think about it in psychology a lot because I guess it's one of the major kind of, I want to say polarities that, constantly talking about yep. but of course yeah. that's derived from the culture in which Jung was writing right so that's it um well you know you just were you uh, you know the the dictum that i always use is what you almost hinted at which is i was like 
I'm fine with descriptive. I don't know if I'm very fine with prescriptive. Like descriptive is good. I'm like, let's right. describe, right? Mm-hmm. So when we're describing, yes. what we're noticing is sort of a, a bell curve. So there's an entire panoply of characteristics that biologically mm-hmm. anatomical women embody. And, but that's a bell curve. Some of them embody a lot of those characteristics. Some of them don't embody much of those characteristics and vice versa, right? So absolutely biological differences. I just, one of the things that got me through COVID was in our time, you know, Melvin Bragg's BBC um, uh, podcast. (laughs) And just last night I was listening to his podcast on hormones. So there's an entire hour long discussion on hormones, like what hormones do and how they act, et cetera. So there's no question there's hormonal differences. So there's actual biological, mm-hmm. anatomical, hormonal differences between men and women, which absolutely influence behavior, individual behavior, social behavior, et cetera. But again, mm-hmm. and, and you perhaps know, psychology. Holding that, and therefore psychology, right? And, and, and therefore mm-hmm. psychology, right? So therefore, I guess holding that con- those concepts lightly rather than prescriptively I think it's really the way forward, yes. so to speak. Right. Yeah. Um, yes, I would. Yeah. You know, like that, you know, and that's what I have to say. I think the, the, I, I sometimes get into a little bit of, a little bit of it with these Gen X and Gen Z folks that I know happen to be, you know, 20, mm-hmm. 20, 30 years younger than me. Right. Cause they sort of, I guess they kind of think they invented transgender and bi- non-binary. I'm like, sweetie, i <laughs> I've known transgender people for the last 50 years, you know, like this is not something that happened in, you know, the year 2005. Right. I, I mean, I, I'm grateful to the fact that they have actually in a way pioneered a much, uh, a much more useful language about it than we had 50 mm-hmm. years ago. Right. But I feel like that's also a, a sort of like, like in other words, what's now on what's now on, in everyone's consciousness is that these, categories of masculine and feminine are not that tight or strict. They're pretty yeah. fluid. Mm-hmm. Now, Jung said that in his own way by introducing yes. the idea that there's yes, femininity in mass and male people, right? In his own way, he didn't have mm-hmm. the language. But I will mm-hmm. say like that concept, I mean, you know, we're looking at it from 2024, but you know, imagine being a 1950s guy and having Jung tell you that there's an inner woman that you need to integrate. <laughs> like what? It, so it was I, radical. It was very right, radical. Right. Way, but so he said it in his own way. Mm. I mean, that's even what I was saying earlier in this talk. Like, in other words, there's this. He spent an entire book writing about the androgyne. He's talking about non-binary realities, right? As we would say it these days. Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. what I would say around that. I think like we're, we finally rounded the corner in our culture and in the psychology such that what, what's male and what's female, what's masculine, what's feminine is A, understood as very culturally conditioned. B, as you just sort mm-hmm. of rightly said, we have much more research now than we did before around what the biological, anatomical, physical contributions to what we're calling masculine and feminine happen to be. Mm-hmm. And see, we have much more social permission to go at it individually rather than prescriptively. Like, this is who I am. So I'm going right. to be, you know, I will identify myself as such. Now, of course, you know, people make a mockery of that because I think it excites a lot of their insecurities. You know, if you happen to be, you know, if you happen to be an extroverted thinking type. That's not going to go down very well. Being sort of fluid and open and ambiguous is not going to go down very well, right? Uh, or or Republican, for that matter. I'm, you know, I think there's a certain way of like thinking about these things, right? But nevertheless, I think people are giving themselves much, much more permission to put together their own individual mm, fruit salad of mm-hmm. what that looks like, right? So if a woman wants to kind of download a particular set of characteristics, she may feel it's helpful to her to define that as masculine, or she may feel it's helpful sure. to define that as part of her femininity, right? And, and yeah. again, yeah. descriptive, not prescriptive is the way I go about it. And I feel like Absolutely. that's about the only way we can chart our way through that thicket of issues. and. um 
I would say lay up. Yeah, a found- a what I'm interested in is laying a foundation for people's individuation, right? Like I want people to be individual. I'm individuation is this concept, right? Mm-hmm. So the way you put it together and the way I put it together are not going to be the same. We're individuals, you know, as mm-hmm. long as it's not prescriptive and it's just descriptive. Yeah. But then we bump into, you know, being able to listen to one another. Right. And that's not <laughs> absolutely well, that is not a, a whole other episode. That's everyone wants to talk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like everyone wants to talk. No one wants to listen. But, you know, the, we're trained in listening. Yeah. So that's where I'm coming from. I'm yeah. like listening to what people are telling me is their experience. I'm not telling you what it is. They're telling me what it is. So that's how I would do it. Yeah. I mean, but I think it's a very hot issue, <laughs> obviously, and will continue to be. But yes. In, in this yes. environment of educating people around Jungian concepts, because we are part of that educational milieu, right. that what we're trying to introduce people to is um, their relationship between the archetypes and their individual psyche, because that's really what mm-hmm. we're talking about, Right, exactly. is that the archetypes are eternal, so the archetype of the masculine, the archetype of the feminine, and that we as humans have access or are influenced by these archetypal dynamics. And as we become aware of that, there's also often a tension arises in the psyche. Well, if I, am, if I partake of the masculine archetype, what does that mean? And should, mm-hmm. does that force me into a set of prescriptions? And if right. it doesn't, if I don't adopt that as a prescription, does that mean I'm doing something wrong or am I rejecting that Mm -hmm. archetypal reality? So it's this very difficult dance between archetype and ego, really. Archetype and the Mm -hmm. lived experiences and the profound levels of choice that we have at the ego level, at the physical level, more than perhaps ever in the history of humanity. Mm -hmm. So That's another way to go about it, right? That's another way to go about it. I mean, if we posit, if, you know, again, to go about it in terms of instructing folks uh, with regard to Jungian concepts, right? When we're saying something is archetypal, what we mean is it's available to all human beings, potentially. All human beings, mm-hmm. potentially. It's archetypal. Mm-hmm. So if we, if we posit that masculinity with a capital M and femininity with a capital F or androgyny with a capital A are archetypal realities, right? They're available to mm-hmm. all human beings, regardless of what their genitalia happens to look like, right? And they're yes. available to all human beings as archetypal realities in various degrees that have to do specifically mm-hmm. with you individually, right? So that's another mm-hmm. way to go about it. I mean, uh, this is another reason why, uh, you know, you three are doing this podcast is to sort of make available mm. to people a different way of thinking about it that's based on Jung's ideas of what what an archetype is and what that therefore means. So that's where I would say, like mm-hmm. you, when, when you posit it as an archetypal reality, it doesn't really matter what your genitalia happens to be. It's available to you as a man, as a mm-hmm. woman, masculine, feminine, androgyne. How are you going to put that together? Now, the second thing you said, which is what we as clinicians consistently have to do, is there is tension built into that reality. There's tension between the archetypes, and then there's tension between me and the collective. There's tension between who mm-hmm. I am as an individual and the society mm-hmm. and I'm running around. There's a tension, right? Now, yes. like most people, all people, I would say, who likes to be in a state of tension? I don't like that very much. <laughs> I want that resolved. So I'm just yeah, going to pretend yeah, yeah, that one half of that doesn't exist, yeah. and I'll live over here in this little mm-hmm. room. <laughs> and, right? But what we're constantly yeah. doing as therapists, certainly, um, is trying to make the case to live inside that tension. Don't resolve it. Mm-hmm. Both things are true. Live in the ambiguity. Right. Live in that tension. Right. And eventually That's what great. you'll find you know, it'll forge some kind of very individual solution for the two, for you around Mm -hmm. those two things. But yeah, I mean, most people Mm want to deny one and emphasize the other because it's a state of tension. So that's what I would say. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. I sometimes say to like, I say to, I I say almost, I, one of these days now I'm 66, I'm going to write everything, you know, the wit and wisdom of Rob Hopke in the therapy room. 
So I have about 12 different buttons I pretend I push because I say the same 12 things to eventually say them to all clients. And one of them is, <laughs> I'm here to make your life more complex, not simpler. Yes. The reason you're here is you yeah. have tried to simplify things mm -hmm. and you are not simple. So I'm here to help you tolerate the complexity of who you That's are. That's great. Right? The mm -hmm. reason you, you, you wanted to That's just be really this, great. well, you're not just this, you're that. And if you continue to ignore mm -hmm. that, it's going to keep hitting you in the face. So we need to make a place for that. And believe me, that's uncomfortable. I'm not here to make things simpler. Mm -hmm. I'm here to make things more complex, which means it's going to disrupt things. But, you know, we need to build up that tension tolerance muscle if you're going to actually be who you are fully, right? Instead of split off, project out, or deny mm. pieces of you. So that what you just said there is super important. And especially for anyone listening to this, it's like, yeah, that's a state of tension. That's a state of tension, right? That's a yeah, state yeah. of tension. That's really, so, that's really great. Yeah. Right? Let's hold that. Let's hold that. That's what makes hold that. the fullness. Let's hold it. That's what makes a full <laughs> life is not splitting any I of these that's things good. off. That really uh, introducing people to their own complexity and confronting the way they've simplified things into a binary, which is actually, they may not realize is causing them pain <laughs> and is As we talk in an election year, and I wish we have a yeah, two-party sure. system. It's pretty easy to like, you know, that's yes. what I would say, like nothing in the culture really supports us. That's why as, you know, no, as, as right. young and wingdings over here have, I think, very important things to say. To the culture, I'm like, yeah, it's not binary, yes. not binary. So yeah, nothing so is. that's what I would say. Nothing, nothing is. is. But yeah, it's a state of tension. So it's not just yeah. a state of tension within oneself, but it's also right. a state mm -hmm. of tension between the individual and the collective too. The, right. Well, we're uh, yeah. Rob. We're going to uh, yeah. come to a pause here, and then we're going to transition to a dream interpretation. But I wanted oh. to give you uh, just take some last minutes if there is. Um, any summary statement, you kind of came to that really naturally talking about complexity. Right. Is there, is there, a, yes. well, I guess one question I have is how would you like people to reach out to you if they would like um, for you and, and what you have to say um, to get well, closer I, to? You know, like everyone, I think I have a website. So robhopke.com, mm -hmm. it's pretty easy to mm -hmm. get to, right? Um, mm -hmm. So there's that. And, um, the books are all available online with Amazon. If people wanted yeah. to read any of the books, they're all and, right there. Uh, they're all still available. In what I'll share is, is that we, we will put a link with a book list. We've started doing that on all of our episodes. So I will mention, I will link all of the books we've discussed, yeah. including all of your books, Rob. And right, so right. you can easily reference those. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, you know, again, as you've read the book, so, you know, my voice comes mm -hmm. through in a lot of these books. It's a little bit like kind of having a session mm -hmm. with me, but yeah, that's how, one way to get a hold of me too. Mm -hmm. I guess I was wondering, like are offer. there anything you three wanted to ask that you didn't get to, or is this stuff that you wanted to talk about? I have so much more that I would love to talk to you about. <laughs> it, it would take another day and a half. And, um, <laughs> I know, I feel I, like that I'm too. Just, uh, but you've given us and our listeners a very, very great deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, turning to your books and these ideas, building up that tension and tolerance muscle, and really embracing our complexity is uh, a really good place that I think we can come to a, a stop on just for today. Yeah. Um, but this, there's so much more here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say those characteristics yeah. are at the core of what I think Jung's mm. life work and writing was really about, right? Is sort of yes. complexity. It's, you know, in fact, he coined the concept of complex, right? I mean, People attribute it right. to Freud, but mm -hmm. we know it was his concept. So, you know, he mm -hmm. complexity okay. is really at the key, is at the core of his work. So yeah. if I got that across, I'm happy. Yeah. yeah. A absolutely. Get bigger. It's such a wonderful <laughs> invitation. Get bigger. Do right. Don't shut yourself off into a small room of uh, something that is reified and concrete. Right. Uh, get into life. Right. 
And I think when it, when you take that and apply it to sexuality in particular, you know, in that area of one's life, then that's super interesting, super complicated, very disruptive, mm-hmm. you know, uh, mm-hmm. and that's where I yeah. have to say, I think like that's, you know, the gist of maybe what we talked about today is taking these Jungian mm-hmm. concepts and applying them to sexual orientation, lived sexuality, ideas of gender, ideas of identity. You know, I think there's, that's what I say, I was saying to Joseph, I'm like, I was really happy to be invited to talk about this. I don't get to talk about this very much, but I just think there's mm-hmm. so much in Jung himself, um, yeah. his general concepts and the specific concepts around uh, sexuality and gender that are just so rich that I use all the time. So mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's just been mm-hmm. a delight to be able to talk about them as extensively as I had right. with such right. a great, you know, with such a great mm-hmm. crew of folks who know what I'm talking about, right? Who do it all the time. So, Robert, one of the things that you modeled, which I think is a meta communication for all of us and for the listeners, is that you have a devilish good humor about the whole <laughs> topic. Too. That you there do, is this do. sassy, smiling, uh, yes. bad boy, um, <laughs> mercurial <laughs> dynamism. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's, well, that's part nice of. Of ho- yes, part of holding the yes. topic and not letting it get too hot, not yes. letting it get yep. too tight. And, and yeah. this is that wonderful place where humor can give us a little bit of breathing room mm. to, mm-hmm. try, to try on things with good humor, whether right. they're attitudes or behaviors. Yeah. Yeah. And you just brought that in spades to today's well, you know, uh, interview, I, and I, I do, really appreciate that. I taught that. human sexuality for uh, about 15 years now at the Institute for Transpersonal Psychology at Palo Alto. And then, of course, I do sex therapy and train sex therapists, right? And I'm constantly saying that with my clients. I'm like, sex is supposed to be fun. You know, like, sex is fun. Yeah. Yeah, this yeah. is like, God, you know, this, <laughs> it's not like, it's not this deep, serious, earnest shit like you you should be having fun if you're not having fun you're not having great sex right so that's what i want to say i think when we're talking about sexuality like that yeah it's life for uh, one of my one of my students actually said um (laughs) my students actually said you know she said i love the sexuality class because like sexuality is the origin of life like sexuality is life Mm -hmm. it's literally the origin Mm -hmm. of our lives right so she's like and symbolically it is it's like sexuality should be that's vibrant great. you know so when we're talking about any kind of topic of sexuality i kind of I, I don't know i just mm-hmm. have to open up because it's like it's not a serious thing it should be really joyous <laughs> and wonderful it should be sacramental it should be it should be mm-hmm. thrilling it should be funny it you know it's the whole human experience kind of rolled up in one mm-hmm. so that's why i was well, like you, glad you to hear brought that. that in spades man well that's yeah, sort yeah, of like yeah, you know that's really sort of like, sort of like my, yeah. well, my long training as a sex therapist so Let's see if we can apply uh, some of that same uh, energy to a dream. So our dreamer is a 26-year-old male who works as a musician. And he writes, There is a war being fought between the U.S. and Russia on U.S. soil specifically where my ex-boyfriend lives in Virginia. He lost his life in the war. In waking life, I left him a few days before this dream took place. I am hiding out in his brother's house. I'm a wanted man, either because I'm gay or accused of being a witch. Despite being actively persecuted, my ex-brother and sister-in-law allow me to hide in their house in a small space under the stairs. They are risking everything by doing so. One day, their friend came over with her small child. The child was playing around the house and wandered into the infrequently trafficked area of the house where I was hiding. Mm. He noticed me, pointed, and announced that I was there. Now that the friend knew they were harboring a wanted person, I had to leave immediately. At great risk, my ex-brother-in-law went to great lengths to help me. He packed me food and supplies and drove me to the Appalachian Trail where I could travel north on foot with little risk of being seen. He accompanied me into the forest and briefly showed me the way. Upon returning to the trailhead to say a proper goodbye, we were met by a small group of Russian archers 
with their arrows pointed directly at me. Among them was a friend of mine who works with me. She was sobbing, but did not lower her bow. I had been betrayed by my ex-brother-in-law. I climbed into a ditch and started singing a song from a popular Disney movie I grew up with. Somehow, I convinced the soldiers to join in. Hmm. They laid down their weapons, and I taught them different parts. Hmm. Soon we were all singing in full harmony. It sounded incredible, but more importantly, I was safe. He provides a bit of context about the dream. I just left for another seventh month contract as a singer on a cruise ship. I broke up with my partner a few days before having this dream. I am more free spirited than he who is more traditional and quite ready to settle down as soon as possible, despite being only 25 years old. We want very different things right now. I'm excited for this opportunity to see the world while doing what I love, yet I'm heartbroken and I feel I've lost my best friend. He says his main feelings in the dream were fear, being burdensome, gratitude, shock, betrayal followed by warm and genuine human connection and relief. And he offers a bit more explanation and writes, My ex rents a room from his brother, so I would often stay with them in waking life. His brother has always extended a warm welcome to me. Mm. It's so poignant how the tension, talk about staying in the tension, there, there's this tension and, and the dreamer, uh, he, does, he does stay with it and then a song comes. And I'd be so curious to know what song it was. <laughs> and it's the song that res- resolves, it brings about this incredibly surprising lysis where, where there's this kind of joyous song at the end, which which to me seems to kind of point the way forward for this dreamer. There seems to be a real sense of telos in, in that ending, even as he's uh, in the midst of heartbreak. Uh, you know, I, um, I went to the ending first also uh, because it's so compelling. And I had a slightly different reaction uh, from yours. Okay. And okay. I, uh, be, because um, I wasn't quite sure that I altogether bought it, okay. that there could be such a quick, happily ever after, we mm-hmm, all just, just like get together. Movie. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's a good it's a good point. Point taken. I wonder if the dream is speaking about his general relationship to singing. Because one of the things that mm. when, when you're when you're a gay kid, you join the choir, mm. there's uh-huh. a way in which you can be safe. That yeah. and there's plenty of straight guys as well. So there's a way in which the context provides a way mm-hmm. to co-create with people who are very different from you, joined together in this mission of creating something beautiful and harmonious and a kind of collective project. And, and well, I guess the dream then, in and of itself is. The dream then pokes at that a bit. It's like, are you safe or are you hiding out? Which right, I like think is Harry Potter under good. the stairs. <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah, you're safe. Are you, and are you going to be protected or are you going to be betrayed? Mm-hmm. And are you really free from attack or are you going to be made vulnerable when you're out it? You know, like, again, you know, like, that's why I think mm-hmm. the ambivalence of what you're talking about is definitely there. I kind of felt mm-hmm. like this was sort of a bit of a, I say sort of a, a resume of what was going on unconsciously in the relationship. Mm-hmm. All along, yeah, right. In the relationship with the boyfriend, ah. yeah, the relationship with the boyfriend. Uh, I felt like yeah. this is a little bit like the sort of internal biography of the relationship in a way. You know, mm-hmm. what part mm-hmm. of him? What part of him? Well, first of all, we start in the middle of a war, so that would be the one thing I mm-hmm. want to hear about. Like, okay, yeah, the con- it's already in a yeah. war, 
And it's not just any war, but it's Russia having invaded the United States. It's being fought on native territory. So like, I don't, mm-hmm. I'd be interested in hearing like, what does he, what, is, what does he identify as Russia? Like, what does Russia look like? What does it mean symbolically? What is the United States? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then he's then, then he's sort of trying to take refuge from that tension, right? He's trying to sort of escape from it, but it's not right. working, you know? Mm-hmm. And I would like, okay. So, so that's the other thing I'd be like, okay, what parts of you did you feel like you needed to hide in this relationship all along? Why are you hiding? Mm-hmm. And why are you hiding in this? What's his brother like? Why are you hiding in his brother's space? What is it that you feel kind of like his brother right. represents that you're hiding in? You know, ultimately they broke up. So I feel like that's what, like what we're doing here. I think in the dream is kind of trying to make sense of what happened in the course of the relationship such that, you know, mm-hmm. and that's where I would mm-hmm. go to where Joseph mm-hmm. just ended. Well, all of you have talked about like, okay, it's poignant, but like, that's not the way the dream ends. The dream ends in the sort of like, now happy Disney, we're just going to slap on a Disney song and everything is yeah. great. Right. And I'd be like, yeah. what is that about? You know? So. Mm-hmm. The dream is also about power. That, um, as often happens, and we're seeing this in geopolitical conflict in the world, these powers that are greater than any one person kind of swing into motion. And, you know, Russia invades Ukraine. You know, the people there are doing the best they can to survive, to accommodate, to be agile, to do what one can, and yet still be subject to these massive forces mm-hmm. that no one person can control. So there's also. Right feeling of powerlessness against something more vast than ourselves. If I were to abstract that, there's also an invitation to talk about the archetypal dimension of change in our lives. That yes, on a, on a horizontal level, you and the boyfriend had whatever conflicts of values or other things in the way, but there are also mysterious reasons why people come together and why they separate. That the gods mm-hmm. also um, decide when something has finished and when something will begin. Mm-hmm. And while it's frightening to feel like we are being tossed around by these vast unconscious forces, it also gives us a sense of sharing responsibility because often when a relationship fails, the ego, the individual often thinks, oh, what did I do wrong? Or it's all that son of a bitch's fault over there. <laughs> But there's a, there's, there's a lot of forces pressing upon us that oftentimes we are forced to accommodate. So in the face of that, in the face of the dream that forces him to have to be very subject to, he's being agile and in a sense being a bit of a trickster. You know, we're about to kill you. And he's able to convince them, hey, let's all mm-hmm. sing a song. You know, it's a very, <laughs> yeah, yeah, very yeah. trickstery. And then he's able Mm -hmm. to do it almost Mm -hmm. like he has some kind of magical power. Like he throws this dust and everybody thinks they're singing in a choir. And then perhaps as he's slowly slinking off stage, you know, trying to save his (laughs) life. Um, Mm. Yeah, the power issue is, I I would ask him, I mean, that power issue is very interesting. I think I, rather than interpret the dream, I guess the dream brings up questions I would ask him, right? Which would be like, mm-hmm. What, mm-hmm. what was the power struggle going on between the two of you underneath there, right? Because that's what we're talking yeah. about. Like, that, yeah, like yeah. that's a very salient issue in the stream. Like, what's the power struggle? What were you trying? What were you feeling kind of oppressed by or trying to hide out from in the relationship? You know, again, to sort of bring to consciousness well, what, what went wrong. Well, he says in the he says in the context, the comments uh, that his partner wanted to settle down. And he's enjoying his adventurous life on a cruise ship. Right. But why that would be symbolized uh, as something like a U.S.-Russia war is sort of interesting to me. You know, I mean, like that makes sort of sense to me. But why it's symbolized the way it's symbolized in such a dramatic way in the dream is what I'd be curious to have him reflect on. And the Russians have killed his boyfriend. Yeah. I mean, that's how the dream starts. That's true. So and he's some, at risk. This he's force at risk greater of being than them killed. has right. invaded. Right. That's right. Invaded the psyche, and it's it's doing things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Deb. Deb. Yeah. 
Well, what I'm thinking about is um, that our dream ego uh, isn't participating in the war. Uh, the mm-hmm. war just happened, um, mm-hmm. unfortunately, and very sadly, the ex-boyfriend was killed. He goes and hides out. Uh, then a child kind of outs him. Then he flees with uh, the help of his brother-in-law uh, to the Appalachian Trail. Uh, and then uh, everything ends happily ever after. And I would be curious about Hmm. What part of you is is a Russian? What part of you aims a bow with arrows at our dream ego? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, mm-hmm. where you know, and there was a breakup. So presumably, there was yeah. some kind of a of a, a quote war unquote. Well, and a death, and a death, a conflict. There was some kind of yeah. There was yeah. Okay. And, and the sin he's accused of, or what makes him vulnerable, is that he's gay and or accused of being a witch, both of which mm-hmm. put him in this category of, of yeah. great otherness, yeah, uncanny, um, queer mm-hmm. otherness. Mm-hmm. And although well, that's an the Russians thing. are coming after him. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, that's an interesting the Russians are coming that after all witch, the U.S. Witchiness are being equated here, right? I'm like, okay. Exactly. Yeah. I was thinking that more generally, like, again, because we're talking about it within the context of this entire sort of podcast here, um, you know, like, I would, I'd be interested in having him talk to me a little bit about how he feels this dream applies to his being gay, not just this mm-hmm. particular mm-hmm. relationship. Like, is this, is this mm-hmm. relation, did this relationship bring up things that have to do more generally with how he feels about being gay? Because you're right, that's the first one of the first things in the dream. Like, what is he being accused of and persecuted for is being gay or a witch? How are those two things equivalent? What's been his? What was his personal experience around that? You know, I don't. That's not here, but I would want to hear about that. I have a feeling less maybe about the specific relationship he was in, and maybe more about his mm-hmm. homosexuality and his feelings about homosexuality or experiences being gay man more generally. Yeah. So this really reinforces, highlights, underlines the theme that's run through our whole topic today, which is, listen, I'm Mm -hmm. curious, Mm -hmm. tell me more. What is this like for you? What about that? Yeah, which I think kind of... mm -hmm. Go ahead, Joseph. Without having the dreamer here, we often do speculate just so we can Mm -hmm. try to offer frames Mm -hmm. with which one might interpret the dream. And of course, we know that we don't know the dreamer. But one of the things I'd like to suggest is that uh, the symbol of Russia is Mother Russia. <laughs> and, and it is very substantive. Having been to East Germany before mm. the wall was pulled down, Mother Russia and the Mother Bear is a right. thing. So <laughs> a couple of fantasies I'm having is that there's a massive activation of the mother complex, and it has invaded the psyche. It has killed the brother, it has killed the lover, and it has persecuted him for being the gay kid. And its influence is so pervasive that he regresses and becomes a child like Harry Potter, living Mm -hmm. under the stairs, Mm -hmm. totally Mm -hmm. dependent upon the goodwill of the brother and his wife. So he becomes a child in the presence of this Mm -hmm. overwhelming mother complex. He's identified as the, um, the scapegoat. I wonder about that in terms of the mother complex relationship. The positive father figure or brother sets him out there on the trail, but once again, he is betrayed. And there is the feminine. The mother is coming after him, and the archer that he focuses on is his female friend. And she's mm-hmm. compassionate. She's sobbing. And yet, she is still has the arrow he's, towards he's him. He's got a bow, right, pointed right at him. So yeah. one of the compensations that young gay boys feel is that charming and delighting their mothers are a refuge. Mm. And, and that's a thing. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. vivacious singing and dancing, you know, high-flying air hmm. is a way 
to interface with the mother by delighting her. Mm. And so I wonder if that's also a talent that he has, but as Robert's pointing out, it may not be adequate because he does mm. seem very regressed in the dream. And there may be something mm. more dynamic and aggressive that he needs access to, but he's a little boy right now mm. in the face of Mother Russia. So mm. the task yeah. really is, you know, he, he's surviving. He, he has a coping mechanism in the face of the, the murderous great mother. Mm. And, you know, it'll, it'll get him back on his feet, back on the cruise ship, singing and dancing, you know, back in his life. But the larger question is about initiation. Is that really the best or only tool that he has to face the incursion of Mother Russia? What's interesting about that interpretation is a couple right. of things. I guess I'm borrowing kind of a page from a Berkeley analyst here, Gareth Hill, who wrote Masculine and Feminine, Flow of the Opposites. So instead of talking about the polarities of an archetype as being positive or negative, Gareth talks about them as being static or dynamic, right? Mm -hmm. So if you identify Russia with the feminine, it's interesting to think mm -hmm. about the feminine in this circumstance, symbolically as well as in its own experience, as being the static principle. Not that hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, Russia mm -hmm. is pretty static, right? But that's what I would say. It's sort of very interesting to think about the feminine, the mother piece, being something this person feels oppressed by, persecuted by, confined by, that he has to escape, that he has to, that it's, it's unfree. He has to free himself mm, from it. He broke mm -hmm, up with the guy mm -hmm, who wants mm -hmm. to settle down. It's just interesting because you don't right. generally think about the feminine as being sort of the static, conventional, oppressive. It's much more like what you were talking about, right? You think about the masculine as being, you know, the masculine capital M being, yeah. you know, the principle of conventionality, of stasis, of, you know, tradition, et cetera. But in this person's psyche, perhaps because he's gay, doesn't come at all of these gender experiences from the same place most people do. Mm -hmm. He's experiencing Mother Russia as being potentially, um, yeah, as you just described it, invading him possibly oppressing him, mm -hmm. threatening yeah. his life. He Getting has to young. escape from, it's his masculinity. It's his gay boy masculinity. It's his gay boy that has to kind of escape. And he's using his tricks. He's, you know, being charming. He's, he's singing, charming. he's dancing, he's doing his gay thing here, you know, and it works. He gets, you know, he kind of dances away, Absolutely. you know, he doesn't get killed. So. And this I, is the Cabell Addis myth. Mm. Uh, what I'm appreciating, though, is um, his access to, you know, just anatomical reality of men are built for thrusting. <laughs> and off he goes on a cruise ship that is itself built for thrusting its way through the waters of the Great Mother. Yeah, <laughs> I'm up, I'm my de up, but yeah, my dear, right. it's the woman who holds the bow and arrow aimed at his heart. It doesn't get any more phallic than an arrow. <laughs> so that, I've that got is to say, pretty right? phallic. Right? And we're like, whoa, yeah. okay. And he's the one that's sort of on the potentially receptive side of that phallic energy, mm -hmm. right? But he escapes it. Mm -hmm. Which I think that's why I say the ambivalence right. of these issues are just so rich. Yeah. When yeah. Dip, yeah. Down, but the dianic well, spirit of the arrow. That Diana is basically saying, you're an mm -hmm. intruder. You're the outsider, yeah. and you're going to get killed. We're going to shoot an arrow in you because you're not, <laughs> as a man, right, right, right. you're not allowed to be here. Well, we should say down, a comment for your listeners. Mm -hmm. What you're doing, what Joseph's doing is we call amplification. Like the, the technical yes. term <laughs> yes. for what we're doing is amplification. That's like right. we're taking mm -hmm. associations from other aspects of culture and applying them to the dream. Diana the gods, et cetera. So the Joseph, you know, for those of you listening, that's right. doing an amplification and action there. Yes. <laughs> and it's also very much a classic Cabell Attis myth in as much as Cabell is the great mother, Attis is her son, but also he expects him to be her son, her first priest, and her lover, as often ah. happens in these mystical creation myths. Attis falls in love with someone else. And the great mother says, absolutely not. 
your, your primary duty is to serve the creatrix of all things. And in this mm-hmm. impossible tension, he flees into the forest, castrates himself, is a threat of dying, and Cabell turns him into an evergreen tree so that at least some portion of him will vegetatively stay alive. So we have this incursion of a great mother. We have the death of a boy. We have this remaining um, frightened part of the ego who is, does not want to return to the great mother to, to be the priest and lover, and yet does not know how to escape from this. And Neumann also talks about this in the evolution of consciousness, that the great mother is moving out of the unconscious and just becoming fully himself as he is. So, as you said, that's an amplification. I think the dream there's is about so hoping. much to do. Yeah, there's so, so much, much to, to do, do with this dream. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.